morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's always a bit of a challenge just saying hello at Signum University because we are a global organization. And in our panel today, uh, we have three time zones. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And looking at our attendee list, I see that some of you have got up early and some of you are staying up late. So thank you very much uh, for doing that. It's wonderful to see so many people joining us for this very exciting event. My name is Gabriel Schenk. I'm a teacher at Signum University. And tonight we are gonna be talking about this new book by Owen Barfield, uh, The Tower, Major Poems and Plays. And we have the two editors of this volume, as well as the publisher to talk about this new book. And we're also really excited to have the author's grandson, Owen Barfield, named after his grandfather, uh, who will be talking a bit about his grandfather's work uh, in general as an introduction, because I know so many people are aware of how important Owen Barfield is, um, but they haven't necessarily read a great deal of Barfield or know a great deal about him. In that Venn diagram of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, Owen Barfield is that big third circle in the middle that overlaps them both. And uh, I think a lot of people are aware of that, but they don't necessarily know what's contained in that circle. So um, we're excited to hear from Owen uh, about a little bit about that tonight, a little, a little introduction um, for the first uh, part of this session. And then we will be hearing from uh, the editor, Dr. Leslie A. Taylor, who is an independent scholar who specializes in classical and Renaissance literature, and Dr. Jeffrey H. Taylor, who is a professor of English at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Um, and they will be talking uh, in more detail about this volume in particular. Um, after that, we will open up to a general question and answer session. Uh, so please have your questions and your comments ready. You can use the questions box, which is on the right hand side of the screen to type out your questions and your comments. Uh, and those will be saved and I can read them out when we get to the Q&A. You don't have to wait until the Q&A uh, to ask those questions. Uh, so just uh, type them out as you think of them. If you would prefer to talk to our panel, uh, using your voice and your microphone, you can also let me know that you would like to interact in that way and I can unmute you. Although do be aware that this session is being recorded and will go on YouTube uh, afterwards. So you can you can choose just to type out your questions if you prefer. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping out of the way. So I'd, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Owen Barfield, who is the grandson of the author Owen Barfield and the trustee of the literary estate. Um, and Owen is going to do, um, it's going to uh, talk about um, his grandfather now, um, after, whenever you're ready, Owen. Okay, well, thank you, Gabriel, for that introduction, but a special thanks to Leslie, Jeff, and Dave for bringing this book to fruition. I'm not going to say too much about the book itself because other people know far more than I do about it. But, you know, I really do send out a heartfelt felt thanks to them for their hard earth efforts and uh, much stamina that is required to, to bring this through. I do notice uh, that it's almost about 100 years since grandfather started to think about this book and started to put pen to paper. And now when we actually finally get it published, so 100 years and people might think that, you know, well, that Barfield chap, he's not fast, is he? You know, he's not very um, you know, good at getting stuff done. But then everything's a sense of perspective and proportion. 100 years. What is 100 years? I was thinking, I mean, if you multiply 100 years by a factor of 20, then that takes us back to the period when um, Christ was incarnated. So the divine word was incarnated just 100 years ago times 20. You know, it's not that long ago. In fact, humanity is really just at the start of its sort of journey in Christ. And um, this kind of thinking, this time, type of perspective and thinking about what things mean is really what, it was at the core of grandfather's philosophy. 
And I use that word carefully because grandfather was a philosopher. And if you like, he gave the philosophy to the Inklings. The Inklings acknowledged him as the philosopher. So we need to think, what is it that the Inklings had in common and, and why did they acknowledge him as a philosophy? Well, one thing that they did uh, together was they were fighting positivism. So positivism is the word that they used, which we now say um, a reductive materialistic worldview. That's what we say now, but they called it positivism. And this fight of positivism is what they all had in common. They all took that on board and that's what they carried forward. But grandfather called it out, named it and gave them a philosophy in which to conduct that fight. That's one thing. The other thing is imagination. They both had this kind of fascination, enjoyment of, love of the imagination. And I just want to say a bit about imagination because some people struggle with knowing what is the imagination. Do I have it? Have I got it? Do I lack it? Where is it? You know, you know, what is imagination? So in grandfather's context, he was thinking about it in terms of uh, inspiration intuition and imagination so let's look at that a bit more um instinct is a, possibly the first um element so an instinct if we go we're not there yet uh, gabriel instinct is um something that you feel in, within you you feel it from within you and it goes from you outwards you have an instinct about something inspiration is something that you receive from outwards and it comes inwards. So it's outside of you, it comes in with inspiration. Then imagination is again, something that you find within you and you bring out. So you have there a rhythm of an in, out, a rhythmic pattern and, and a, a sort of threefold nature. Now, these are the things that grandfather was really interested in. And I'm trying to simplify here, but you know, he'd take this threefold nature, this rhythmic pattern, this polarity, and this central third thing are the cause, core of his uh, thoughts. Now he wrote some of these up in a book called Worlds Apart. And Worlds Apart is a book that C.S. Lewis was reading on his deathbed. And uh, from that book, I drew up this diagram to illustrate that. In this diagram, you sort of see a little bit of that rhythmic pattern. So if we're taking the uh, vertical access first of all starting with body you have body soul and spirit well body soul and spirit was the way that humanity was understood to be for a long time especially in the early christian period in fact it was thought to be like that all the way up until the year 869 when it was formally um changed by the fourth uh, council of constantinople when they disbarred spirit they took out the spirit and if you have that threefold pattern, but you take out the third element, the third footing of the bridge, if you like, the body no and the soul no longer have anywhere to go. So one of grandfather's interests is to sort of revive or to remind us the spirits there. It's a threefold pattern, body, soul, and spirit. And it'd be good to think in that threefold way. The other patterns that grandfather was very interested in was thought, feeling, and will. And for these purposes, you can think of thought as something being active, will being something being, um, sorry, will being active, thought being passive. And you have the polarity there of two active and passive thought and will. In the middle, you have that balance point of feeling. So finding that feeling point is, if you like, finding the soul. And grandfather extended that in his philosophy into unconscious mind and conscious mind. So the conscious mind might be patterns when you're awake, unconscious when you're asleep. But these patterns you see replicated through life, death, winter, summer, all sorts of rhythms in nature. And that rhythmic alteration between them, day and night, um, that's where you find a rhythmic alteration. And that's where you find, if you like, the soul of humanity, but also the soul of nature. There's one other diagram that I'd like to share with you, which um, Grandfather actually drew in an essay that he wrote in 1928. It's published in a book called Romanticism Comes of Age. 
And in essence, it also is described in his main book, Saving the Appearances. So Saving the Appearances describes essentially this pattern that we can see, leading from original participation in the top left through to final participation in the top right through this U-shaped curve. Now, I'll just talk you through it a little bit. Um, it's, there's a, a descent from the spiritual world into the material world. And that material world first manifests itself, or the first body, if you like, is the physical body, which is connected to the mineral world. Then from that, the next level of body that, that materialized uh, is the, well, not quite materialized, but made itself known is the etheric body. And that's associated with the plant kingdom. And here there is a historic time period, which is the ancient Indian type period. And that has a little bit of an echo in the culture of vegetarianism, a respect for the plants and plant world that we find in that, that period. That derives from this time of humanity. The next period that evolved uh, was the astral body, and that's associated with the animal realm. Animals will also share with humans an astral body just as plants have an etheric body and the, that again there's a historical period which is the ancient uh, persian period and here we see the very first human civilizations in that fertile crescent where farming is first introduced there's hu animal husbandry is first introduced and there's starting to be kind of systems of association with animals that's the astral body that we associate which we share with the animal body at um, animal realm and then later the ego emerged now the ego is what makes humans humans if you like only the humans have the ego that emerged through in this egyptian period and that's why when we look at human history we really see a change or a starting point in this Egyptian Chaldean period of, uh, of history. What we're seeing there is this ego that has emerged start to manifest or work through the astral body, which is the body closest to it. And it creates this period of time that's called by um, grandfather, but also by Rudolf Steiner, the sentient soul. It lasts a certain period of time, about 3000 years or so. And then it moves into um, the next period called the intellectual soul, whereby the ego starts working through the etheric body. And we can see that from about 750 BC. In 750 BC, something very definite happens, evidence of which you can see both in the Hebrew text, but also in the old ancient Greek text. The Greeks being concerned with space, the Hebrews being concerned with time. So you see a different relationship between time and space beginning to manifest and working through this period, which is called the intellectual soul. But something very ha important happens during this period, which is that the divine word or the divine being manifests and incarnates in the figure of Jesus Christ. And there we have a reversal of time, a reversal of history, and grandfather would say that um, the divine is felt from outside coming in to inside going out. That's the opportunity for humanity through its ego to have a felt change of consciousness. That period lasted up till 1450. And again, it's kicked off the period of the Renaissance and all the periods of discovery when the ego started working through the physical body. And it's this physicality that we're still feeling. We're still in this age of the consciousness soul. We still feel our own physicality. The next stage is well, that, we've, that humanity has got to pass through, um, again, is the ego working through these bodies, which I've just mentioned, all the way up and re-engaging with the spiritual world. And there's a relationship with, with the um, bodies on the way down as there was on the way up. Just to say that grandfather would argue that the way to get from where we are now to the next level, the spiritual self, is through the imagination. So it's through exercising the imaginative soul that humanity moves forward from consciousness soul to spirit self.
just want to con um, conclude here that the evolution of the earth and the evolution of human consciousness are in reality one single process according to grandfather so nature and humanity are linked on their future path and where we go is very much determined by us by humanity and the decisions we take thank you well, thank you so much, Owen, um, for that a fantastic introduction and sort of, uh, you know, gateway to the world of uh, and the work of your grandfather. Um, I, it reminds me why I find reading Barfield so exciting, because there is that whole new perspective for me. Um, and uh, it's really great to hear you um, talk about that. Um, I'd love to uh, invite um, Dr. Leslie Taylor and Dr. Jeffrey Taylor uh, to the stage uh, at this point. And I should also point out that um, uh, Dave, uh, uh, Dr. Blakesley is also uh, here um, representing Parlor Press, who have uh, the publisher of this new book. Uh, and so um, uh, now we'll hear from the editors uh, and, and a bit from the publisher as well about this, this new volume, which uh, Owen mentioned, um, uh, but uh, we'll hear more detail about uh, exactly what's in this book and this new exciting uh, edition. Hello. Um, first, we're going to give a background about how the book came about. And after that, Jeff and I are going to read from different sections of the book and also from some excerpts from Poetic Diction, which was also published in 1928, the same year as the essay that um, Barfield published on consciousness. So uh, it all began about 10 years ago where we were co-directing together the honors program at MSU Denver. And I had designed and I was teaching a class on the epic tradition. And we read books such as Virgil's Aeneid, but we also read the uh, Finnish Kalevala and also Njal Saga, which is one of the Icelandic family sagas. And Jeff had designed and he was teaching a class on the Oxford Inkling. And we had many of the same students who enthusiastically applied Barfield's theories to the mythopoetic uh, epics that we read in the epic tradition class. And they formed a group that was called the Original Participants. I should tell you a little bit about this group, but it really was, uh, this was a class that took me years to get it through curriculum committees because people thought, oh, no, this is why would we want to do this? But eventually I did managed to have a senior seminar in, in the Inklings cross-listed with honors and and a really great group of students that um, when the class was over, they didn't want it to be over anymore. So uh, they, they formed a group first on campus and then as they graduated and such, then in the greater Denver area, a little bit like the Inklings, a group of people that would informally, sometimes more formally than informally, meet together and read things to each other and talk about things. And a lot of that was centered on um, the ideas of Owen Barfield, but also uh, Tolkien and Lewis and Charles Williams and, and others. Um, and as they spread even beyond the Denver area, they tried in the last uh, part of that original participants to exist as a blog. And, and that didn't actually work all that well, except the great thing about that blog was that uh, Owen stumbled on it and um, found my email address on the blog and uh, wrote me, introduced himself. Uh, uh, Leslie and I were so glad to to get to know him. Um, soon after that, we were in, in Britain in uh, 2012 for the International Medieval Congress at Leeds. We were both presenting there and uh, we uh, arranged to meet up with Owen um, in Reading and uh, got to know him a bit and he showed us some of the work he was doing and um, both with his grandfather and some of his own work with painting and such and that was the beginning of a, a really nice relationship that led to all this. Uh, two years later in 2014 we were again back at the Leeds conference and this time uh, we met up with Owen at the Bird and the Babe in, in Oxford. And uh, um, that kind of led to um, Owen talking to us about the archive at the Bodleian. And um, soon after that, I started to put together an application to take a sabbatical. Um, and with, uh, with Owen's uh, support and such, was able to get that sabbatical 
to go to the Bodleian and spend some time in that archive, which we did in 2016, in, in March of 2016, and then uh, and began at that point to start working on uh, some of these texts and getting them uh, ready for um, really first for publication on the website. Uh, and that was uh, Gabriel had uh, was a great help in that, in that too on the estate website. Um, and uh, um, that really started with Angels at Bay and then the Unicorn. And I guess I'm right and then um we also as early as 2016 we had discovered the copy of the of the manuscript of the tower in the bodleian and um jeff had had the opportunity to um start turning in a pdf form so we had already started to work with that and um we both realized that this was a very unique work and um we both were very strongly attracted to it and in um it is in November of 2018, I actually presented on the tower at a Pamela conference. And the title of my paper was um, From From Sordello to the Prelude, Lewis's Reading of Barfield the Tower. And that paper that I presented is now the first section of the introduction to the tower. And then um, it was well received. There was a lot of um, enthusiasm in the audience. So when we returned back to Colorado, I started working up a more extensive introduction to the tower. And I pretty much then started going through section through section and paying close attention to the parallels between the tower and also the early philosophy of Barfield as presented in History and English Words and also Poetic Diction. And then that, as I continue to work on it, that's now the, um, as it stands, the um, introduction to the tower in the publication and we sent this the tower itself plus the introduction to um owen barfield on um i think it was september right 2019 2019 and uh and and when we sent it uh, as as owen was um hinting at earlier we were um talking about that this could be more than just something to put on the website this could really anchor a publication and about that same time um this is this is where uh dave and parlor press comes in is uh, another thing that we were doing as part of our research was spending some time in the howard nemirov archive at washington university in st louis um and uh, uh, Nemirov, uh, poet laureate, probably one of the most fantastic poets of the 20th century, was two of, he, he actually had a lot of correspondence with a lot of very interesting people, but uh, two people that he was very uh, influenced by was Kenneth Burke and Owen Barfield. And uh, having myself spend a good amount of time studying both Burke and Barfield, um, I was looking for some connections uh, uh, between Barfield and Burke through Nemrov and uh, found a few tenuous things, but uh, there was going to be uh, further research in the Burke archive in Pennsylvania this year with a grant, but um, the pandemic had a, a different opinion on and that that hasn't happened yet. But nonetheless, uh, um, that's one of the ways which uh, in, in which uh, we had been in contact with Dave over the years through the Kenneth Burke Society, and I think it was was it 2011 that where the conference was at Clemson was that what? So just a little before this, and so um, began to talk a little bit uh, with Dave about these connections, and in and and with that suggested to him that Parlor Press, which um, I think it really started as a as a venue for to get some of Burke's things out there, um, but has right. expanded since then to a lot of other areas. But maybe Parley Press would be interested in in publishing um, a book of poetry uh, by and drama by Owen Barfield. Go ahead. So we um, all signed the contract in December of 2019. Um, it was a, a bit of a challenge 
to do this. We've published other books before, but there's a lot that was involved with this. Uh, Barfield was very specific with the layout, especially of the dramas, where one line ended, the next line needed to begin at that exact spot. So there was much involved and we rushed to get to meet our deadline. <laughs> our deadline for our first draft was March 1st, but we made it. And, um, and it was great to work with Parlor Press. Thanks again, Dave. You know, I, I, I have to point out perhaps that right as we were beginning all this is right when the pandemic was starting. And we were perhaps a little more aware of, that, of it than others because of Leslie's uh, uh, teaching online uh, in to children in Asia and such. So that um, it it seemed to the, the hard work of actually putting together the, the work of getting the text together um, had been slowly done over the years, but the hard work of getting this together and getting intros in shape seemed to coincide with uh, turmoil in the world in some some interesting ways. But to take us back to the tower, I will say this, is when I had that sabbatical in 2016 and the two of us went um, to the Bodley, it was mainly drama I was looking for. And I, you know, I was looking for Angels at Bay, um, which has been written about and though, though never published before. and I had been uh, uh, intrigued by an entry on the Sangreal that um, eventually did, eventually has been published on the on the website and such. But one of the things that I didn't know anything about was the tower. And when I discovered it there, it, it, to be quite honest, sitting there in the in the Westin and blown away by reading this poem, so that as as my sabbatical time neared its end, as summer was coming to a close and I was getting ready to go back to teaching, I one of the last things I did was sort of scramble to transcribe the tower and then really put it aside to focus on other concerns. But I copied one scrap of it into a file that sat on my computer desktop and drew my attention from time to time. And this is a part um, <clears throat> and the climax of section 12. The poet sees the universal soul and discerns the individual strands humanity weaves in the perennially created whole. In contrast, the rigid framework of knowledge put up by the world is inevitably perfunctory and mechanistic. And this is the first, I'm just going to read that little scrap. And I think that uh, Gabriel has it. Do you have that part on? No, I guess that uh, I guess that's not on there. So let me go ahead and read there. This is just a little piece from part 12 of the tower. For this neat abacus, which put up for truth was but the husks of dead truth strung together by a mechanic joiner. Knowledge is not until it is the thing it knoweth. Knowledge is life incarnating in consciousness. And I kept it there because for this, for me, this encapsulated much of the postmodern critique of epistemology, much of what Barfield was trying to say in the 1920s and continued to reframe and teach throughout his life. And now do you wanna read a little bit from? We were going to read a little bit from the tower at this time. And we'd also like to uh, share sections from Poetic Diction. So I'll start with a quote from Poetic Diction. And this is from chapter two, uh, which is entitled The Effects of Poetry and uh, on page 44. Thus an introspective analysis of my experience obliges me to say that appreciation of poetry involves a felt change of consciousness. The phrase must be taken with some exactness. Appreciation takes place in the actual moment of change. It is not simply that the poet enables me to see with his eyes and so to apprehend a larger and fuller world. He may indeed do this, as we shall see later, but the actual moment of the pleasure of appreciation depends upon something rarer and more transitory. It depends on the change itself. And then here he inserts an example of a coil of wire and it's um, being passed through a, an electric current. So it is with the poetic mood, which like the dreams to which it has so often been compared, is kindled by the passage from one plane of consciousness to another. It lives during that moment of transition and then dies. And if it is to be repeated, some means must be found of renewing the transition itself. And now we'd like to read uh, from a corresponding section of the tower. And this is from section five, which um, we have called recovery. Barfield did not 
give titles to the different sections. Uh, Lewis actually did. <laughs> so, yeah. but this one is one that we've come up for ourselves. Section five comes immediately after the section where the protagonist is traveling in the ambulance after being injured. So um, this starts about line um, 44. I, for now, this man began to be not one soul, soul, but two. He could no longer trace the ligature that ties an evening to a morning mood. Often at night before his hearth reading, alone or struggling to compose the cauldron of formless impulses that burst to dreams, fast as each bubble to the surface. Often at night, if by the end he had succeeded in taming down his mind to be receptive, wide-eyed with bodily fatigue, he grew aware as of a faintly singing cloud enveloping his head and warily closing his volume, would feel in his blood the pressure of unwritten poetry knocking. I can all things. No imagery formed in his mind, no thoughts, and yet it seemed his essence and the essence of the world flowed. And if he could maintain the mood long enough time, the brain must of itself construct new metaphors and move the world to tears and wonder with its terrible art. But then when he awoke after 10 hours of death-like sleep, shaking it off, he smiled at the, all those reveries and thought those dreams worms spiring through a lump of lifeless clay until the stuff seems living. He who laughed at fatuous affectation, he who knew that fire burns are seven and two are nine, this was the real I. So that exhibits the struggle to maintain uh, that felt change of consciousness. Now, do you want to read from... We'd also like to read a section from um, chapter three, A Poetic Diction on, on Metaphor. The full meanings of words are flashing iridescent shapes like flames, ever flickering vestiges of the slowly evolving consciousness beneath them. To the Locke Mueller France way of thinking, on the contrary, they appear as solid chunks with definite boundaries and limits to which other chunks may be added as occasion arises. And we'd like to read then a section from um, a section 11 of the tower. And this is the section that Lewis referred to as enlightenment in the reading room of the British Museum. Under a gray dome inscribed with echoes of the past, the names of poets dead, and between walls fashioned echoes of the past, the thoughts of dead men petrified in tomes he saw, he saw forever. As when forked lightning shatters the secret knife, the flash has vanished, but not the bright map in the shepherd's brain of rocks and trees and shapes of hills and sheep, that he whose soul would touch the very past must build himself a delicate consciousness out of the dreams of old civilizations, must see with ancient eyes, not wisely peer through glasses of the last half hundred years, and that whose soul would truly touch the present must first have touched the past. How choose the stream that hurries on through complicated webs of thought, which meanings of words ever changing, keep letting down into it for a moment, for the weak webs are torn away and whirled on with the rushing torrent. Um, you know, um, one thing about the, that's interesting about the tower is that a lot of it is like this, where it's a, it's a bit didactic, it's explaining these concepts there is within it also things that illustrate them uh, more directly that attempts that uh, bringing the reader into that felt change of consciousness. Now, in later years, as, as uh, Barfield continued to write uh, really excellent poetry, the poetry shifts more to, rather than explaining these ideas, really pulling the reader and giving the reader that experience of ideas. And this is you know, something that's talked about in the introductory material to the Orpheus drama and such. And so um, I'd like to read a little bit um, from Writers on Pegasus, because I think this is a, a place where we can really see that um, and see that um, Barfield understood that the evolution of consciousness takes work. Much of it, the remaking and rediscovery of meaning itself, and poetry, he rightly discerned, lies at the heart of this work. Barfield had complete faith in the power of his poetry, even if other people weren't paying attention to it, because he had a deep knowledge of the genesis of meaning through mythic forms and the poetic principle. 
The proem to Pegasus lays out his poetic program powerfully and asks others to join him in the challenge of grasping ancient power to evolve future consciousness. Um, the mythic forms underlying consciousness are still vital. The poet may still tap those forces, not just to say something new, but to make part of the world and to make the world anew. One may learn the depths of meaning and draw from them that which is fresh revelation from powerfully true ancient roots. Indeed, this is how tales can be most true. Um, and some of that was from the introduction. But I want to read now the proem to uh, Writers on Pegasus. And it, it is truly a proem in that it, it uh, begins the poem, but it comes before part one. And it really is a statement and challenge about poetry. Of Perseus and Andromeda, my verses. And yet this tale has slept till now untold. For a delve in thine own heart, thou too shalt find how their long grain brought in an age of gold in Ethiopia, where they grew not old, but passed as thou dost, listening through time out to the myth, the word whose form is man. Therefore, my tale is news, the dew's still on my rhyme. The dew, this drawing up from my own earth, how myth being present in the word began to sketch on time, his everlasting now in master tableaus. Once the soul of man took form and substance, takes it rather, Pan is piping here and chase Bellerophon, strong arm and martial spirit, friend in thee trampling beneath what whose chimera passes on. Poets, deep minds, would ye be priests of meaning, makers or scribes? Oh, utter all ye are, Reach in those souls, the world's prophetic soul. The whole in each become particular. The myth disclose the word. Growing aware of old imagination, born anew as young experience, withered words shall bloom then, and all your tales, like this new tale of mine, be true. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you so much. Um, both of you for the, for the uh, explanation, that presentation, and that reading as well. I mean, it's such a, a the, all those selections were so beautiful, um, and uh, really, really great to hear. Uh, uh, so thank you again. Um, I'd like to invite the audience um, for your comments and your questions as well. Please don't be shy. Just type them out in the questions box. And as I say, if you prefer to talk um, through your microphone, you can also do that as well, if you just let me know. Um, but I, I had a kind of question I wanted to ask, uh, which occurred to me when I was when I was listening to that beautiful poetry, and it's a question you ask in the introduction as well, and it may be an impossible question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, why wasn't this published in Barfield's own time? Why did we have to wait until 2020 um, to to have this book? That is an excellent question. Because in the introduction, we do trace out the communications between Barfield and Lewis, and it was intended to be published from the beginning, you know, even as early as like 1922 with the, um, and that's the entry that's in Lewis's diary. So the later correspondence in about this time, you know, about 26, 20, 1926, 1927, is um, Lewis is publishing Dimer, and there's a lot of discussion back and forth between them. But we cannot tell if after 1927, if Barfield ever even attempted to publish this, if he sent it to any publishers. And so we, there's not an exact answer to this. Yeah. What we can say, though, is that it's so strongly connected with poetic diction. So where the tower represents, it's almost like the poetical fruition of poetic diction. But the ideas come to us through still through poetic diction mm. uh, and, and and like we say in the introduction um and and owen could tell us about that his grandfather's life uh took a different direction uh, uh, about that time and and it's one of the stories of his life is his continuing to work on these kind of things when he wasn't getting them published and but also continuing to work on on writing uh, philosophical things that did eventually get published. You know, it's interesting that early on, Barfield published quite a bit of poetry. He he was the member of the Inklings that actually had already had quite a few poems published and had had a 
a Marchen, a, 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 a fantasy story, you might say, published uh, before the others. But there is a shift about this time. And of course, uh, this is another place where Nemrov comes in because his relationship with Nemrov had a lot to do with that, where Nemrov had incredible respect for him and also didn't know why his work wasn't getting out there and did a lot to bring uh, Barfield to North America to for professor for visiting professorships and things like that. And um, but it's an interesting story, and some of that is outlined in the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, so I'm just distracted by the, the wonderful comments coming in, but I, I want to also respond to, to what you've been saying. Um, it's it's interesting you you mentioned Lewis's diamond because reading through the tower, I was reminded of that poem. I, I was also actually I, I I taught a course at Sigmund University this summer, um, which was lectured by John Garth, who's Tolkien's Wars in Middle Earth, and in that course we read through a lot of Tolkien's early poetry and the kind of thing you forget about. You know, you go straight to Lord of the Rings and you forget about the early stuff, um, and I don't want to make too many comparisons, but there is a similarity in in terms of long ambitious poetic project that may not have been that popular at the time it's a sort of a bit more of a victorian thing to do um so you do sort of suggest maybe it, it, it's not so fashionable um and it it seems like the inklings weren't doing things to be fashionable um they had a different kind of uh, uh motive um and yet barfield presumably did want to get published as well so I, um, there's always that tension in our authors about the art and reaching a bigger audience and, and uh, getting published. Uh, Owen, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on that? How important was that for your grandfather? Well, I would, I would, I would say in that first third of his life, that first period, he, can, he saw himself as a poet. He would have described himself as a poet first and foremost, and, and that's how he saw himself. It's, uh, it's only really, you know, in the, when he moved into the second third of his life, right, around about the age of sort of 30, 33, that he sort of then had to put that behind him. I think he was just hoping that one day it would come. He wasn't trying to do the fashionable thing. He was trying to be sort of true to himself and true to his philosophy. And he was trying out different mediums. So we've heard short poems, we've had long poems, we've had marchants. But the main thing he was working on was a long novel called English People. Now, English People still hasn't been published. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we're still sort of waiting for things to come out. Things uh, haven't yet seen the light of day. But um, his long novel was was kind of the defining piece, if you like. And hopefully one day that will be published. And when it is, you know, I think we'll see a whole, you know, bigger picture. I, I, I actually just want to comment on that before we um, go to the audience's questions and comments. Um, we've kind of become used to the idea with the Inklings of just lots of books coming out, um, uh, especially with Tolkien. And I feel like every time someone says, surely there's no more Tolkien books to be published, a new one is born. Um, I thought we'd got to that stage. Uh, and I hear that there's going to be a new book of um, Tolkien's essays on nature uh, coming out soon. And a similar thing happened with C.S. Lewis as well. Uh, 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 he was, he was, uh, Tolkien said to, of Lewis, he's the only one of my friends who's published more after he died than he did when he was living. Um, and of course the same thing happened to Tolkien. Um, but it's, this isn't usual, is it, for authors to keep on publishing so long after they've, they died. So uh, Dave, I wondered what your perspective was as a publisher. Um, how much are you publishing authors who are no longer with us? And what, and what was it like to publish something like this, this book? Um, well, surprisingly, uh, we've published a lot of that kind of work, um, um, mainly with uh, Kenneth Burke. Okay. Uh, Burke and Barfield, as Jeff is investigating, have connections, but we're not exactly sure where they manifested, and uh, we think they know, knew about each other. Uh, but they were both, uh, you know, these giants of uh, literature and, and theory and philosophy for quite a long time, you know, almost the entire 20th century. Um, and um, we published, uh, Parler Press got started because there was a large collection of Burke letters 
uh, that <clears throat> William Ruckert had. Ruckert was Burke's first uh, um, com commentator, uh, wrote the first book on Burke. And um, we knew that they probably would not be published by a major press because one, the letters were just from Burke. <laughs> and we didn't have the Ruckert part. Um, but as a Burke scholar myself, I knew that they would be valuable for Burke people and we were gonna put them on a website. And I said, boy, that's gonna be a lot of work and uh, print on demand publishing, uh, digital publishing started to arise. And uh, um, I said, well, let's make it into a book and we'll publish it. Um, and then we had to think of a, a publisher name uh, parlor comes from Burke's famous uh, unending conversation of history that's going on in the parlor when you're born. Mm -hmm. um, so we did that, published that book, and we've since published his uh, essays toward a symbolic of motives um, um, and some other work too. So it, it's actually quite common. Well, for for Parlor Press, but but perhaps not for the the rest of the uh, the publishing world. But um, that's sort of your speciality, I suppose. Fantastic. Yeah, and and you know the rest of the publishing world is is worried about how many copies are going to sell mm -hmm. uh, of things. And my concern is more as a scholar. Uh, you know, these things need to be out there. They're very important. If mm -hmm. they sell a lot of copies, that's great. If if they just reach the uh, the readers who need them, that's fine. Um, you know, Fantastic. we're not in it to make a big dollar. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, uh, the switchboard has really lit up with lots of comments, so I want to get through to those. Um, so Jeffrey uh, Hippolito, um, it's very helpfully, has given, us, given me a bit more information about um, why this wasn't published. He says, Barfield sent the tower to T.S. Eliot, who had published his short story, uh, Dope, or Dope, uh, and would publish Poetic Diction. Eliot rejected the poem as too long for the criterion and because he just published Yeats' poem, The Tower. He also cautioned Barfield that Yeats was about to publish uh, a book of poems called The Tower, so that I, I did not know that, but um, that's a bit more information, yeah. Um, and Andrew Higgins uh, says, loved The Tower. Uh, more of a comment than question. I thought it was interesting how much C.S. Lewis influenced the shaping of the tower, and it reminded me of the notes he gave to Tolkien on the lay of Lathian. Uh, interesting to see what advice Barfield took and did not. Yes. Uh, that's from Do Dr. Andy Higgins. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yes, that's a very good point, too. Uh, we are fascinated with that. And he did take a lot, though. I There's mean, some of that even, in your introduction. Yes, yeah. yeah, in the introduction, even changing what was the original opening <laughs> of the tower became section eight, he said. And, right. But we also have um, looked at some of Lewis's poetry, too, in The Wade. We have visited The Wade, and there's you can see Barfield, you know, handwriting on the drafts of wow. that, too. So it was going both ways. Also, That's fascinating. But yes, um, from what we've taken from the letters, because we took, um, you know, the complete form of the tower and we actually annotated it into it, every comment that Lewis was making in the letters. So we have that, that version of it as well. And um, yes, Barfield made a lot of revisions based on what Lewis was offering. Well, what we don't have is is multiple manuscripts where we can see the changes, which there are some uh, things in the Barfield archive where you can actually see that. But there are things like the Tower or Medea that whatever uh, echoes from the past there are, what we have is this manuscript and it's not somewhere else. Actually, I think if those two had, if there had been copies of those elsewhere, like at the weight or something, they probably would have gotten more attention than they did. But I was, I was glad to hear the things about, uh, I know that that um, he, the Barfield's relationship with Elliot was um, kind of, at, at a certain point took a turn and Barfield himself describes as not wanting to follow what you were supposed to be doing then and right. instead wanting to do what he, thought was right and that that kind of led to a uh, his uh, a, a bit of a break with Elliot. I don't think they ever feuded or anything but uh, certainly a break and and kind of one of the things that led to his exit 
in those early days from publishing poetry and such. Mm. Right. And Barfield wrote an essay called Poetic License, where he talks about how his approach to poetry differs from the mainstreams of his time. Mm. Oh, very interesting. Um, thank you. Um, Michael Dahl asks, other than learning about Barfield in books on the Inklings as a whole, is there any biography of Barfield or written, already written or coming out? Uh, there is. Um, yeah. Owen, would you like to, to comment on that? Yes, yeah, author... there's one that uh, was published in 2006 by Simon Blacksland de Lange. And right now, the publishers of that have agreed to republish the second edition. And there'll be a kind of a new edition of that biography coming out next year, possibly. Mm -hmm. So his yeah, name you... is Simon Simon Blacksland de Lange. Uh, did you did you want to comment as well, Leslie? Oh no, just to um, mention that we um, are indebted to him. Um, many of the um, quotes that we include are from his analysis of, of these works. That's true. It's one of the first places that a lot of people discover um, some of these works existing. And, um, and there are other places, uh, you know, other scholars over the years that have talked about them, um, especially the three in the middle were known about, but not necessarily available. It's kind of the Tower and the Medea that was known a little about, but, but hardly known about. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, Simon's uh, book is, uh, is is really wonderful, and we're really excited that a new edition's coming out on that. It should be good. Yeah, it's great, and and also, I mean, uh, the uh, the fellowship book um, has a lot of Barfield in it as well, so that's another good thing to read if if you're interested in how Barfield fits in with the the other inklings. Um, C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, and Charles Williams, particularly. Um, Valerie asks a fascinating question. I'm not sure what the answer could possibly be, but I'll read out the, the question and we'll see what we think. Is there a danger of interpreting meaning um, uh, between simply reading versus reading aloud? Can intonation change its interpretation by filtering said meaning through one's own lens? Um, so almost like a quantum physics sort of question there. Uh, and anyone would have a stab at that um I'd like the difference that. between reading and, and reading aloud i suppose i think actually this could fit in quite nicely with um, talking about the evolution of consciousness so one of the things that we've done with some of our research is in, in the same way that uh, that barfield traces the evolution of consciousness through shifts in poetic diction you can also uh, similarly trace it which he does a little bit too through shifts in theatricality and shifts in visual art and such and um there that shift between reading aloud and reading silently is actually a pretty significant shift and in the medieval period uh, people didn't read silently or hardly anybody did there was few people like abelard and such who were reported to have uh done such things but um especially uh you know barfield talks a lot about uh milton's paradise lost and his other works has been a, a significant moment of shift and i think the renaissance is an incredible moment of of shifting consciousness where the uh, where poetry the epic and poetry in general becomes something very different i think um to 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 leap ahead in in what could be way too long of a of an argument i think that reading aloud i think inkling's literature in particular um really reads nicely i think yeah. the lord of the rings was written to be read aloud myself though obviously written not to be obviously to be read as a novel it, it reads beautifully i think that um the poetry that i think owens uh, barfield's poetry um comes alive when it's read aloud um i think that's one of the great strengths of orpheus is that it's actually written as a drama to be done aloud and Maybe Owen could talk a little bit about if he, if we have time that uh, the 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 version of Orpheus done a few years back in California and the real power of uh, of these things when they are manifested out loud. Yeah, I think also his you know if you think of like the Sangreal and his work with Eurythmia and such. Um, if you can bring it aloud, if you can bring it into the body, it's going to be different. It's going to be richer. 
<laughs> yeah, I would certainly concur with that. And um, it's a, a process of creativity as well. And if you're taken into account the spiritual dimension by speaking things, you are bringing in a kind of certain um, elementals, I guess you would call it spiritual elementals. Also bear in mind, you could be reading outdoors as well and having the effects of nature working with you. So there's a community, there's this conversation there, a much bigger conversation than, than often that we're even aware of. This is all happening in our subconscious, but uh, it's certainly powerful there. And I would just um, acknowledge that Orpheus production, it was produced by Jane Hippolito and the Hippolito family in California, Los Angeles. I couldn't go, unfortunately, but um, it's wonderful when these drama pieces are performed. And in this book, we do have quite a number of drama pieces, none of which have ever been performed. So you know, what an experience that would be. Yeah, you know, maybe. I can't help but think of a, of a poem that was published in the in uh, the sampler that where he says, you know, he's fighting against the, the coffee house poetry of the day and says, you know, Who's for poetry that you go out and shout it? I wish I could quote that wonderful poem, but that's I think embedded in even his uh, smaller poems is that idea that things need to be spoken. Absolutely. Um, well, we 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 don't have oodles of time left, but we have we still have some fascinating questions. So I do want to read those out, and um, we'll see how how we do with answers. Um, uh, Michael asks, are there any poets or thinkers who continue the insights that Barfield discovered or developed? Um, I mean, actually, possibly the, uh, I forgot the author's name, but the new... Um, uh, yes. Piranesi. Yeah. Susan. Susan. Yeah, I'm sure someone in the comments can can help us. My mind's gone blank. Piranesi. Um, yeah, that might be one. Um, but I but I think I, but Barfield still. I mean, you know, we've got this fantastic quotation at the um, the front cover. C.S. Lewis, Barfield towers above us all, and there is still a sense of like Barfield's in there, kind of, you know, uh, saying things that that other people aren't saying. Um, I think there's more to come, and I think that. Like Owen was saying earlier, what's a hundred years and such, you know, especially for those of us who spent a lot of time studying medieval and early modern literature and such, it's actually not all that strange for something to sit for a while and then explode forth later. I mean, even Emily Dickinson, the world had had maybe a couple dozen of her poems when she passed away and, you know, and then what, 1600 were published and look what an impact that that, that has had, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that strange for, a poet, a writer, a philosopher to have their day later, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's also that time needs to catch up. There's an understanding that the people just weren't ready. And I think grandfather was aware of this himself. People just weren't ready for what he was saying. And so he was relaxed about that because he had an audience of one, one he said, which was C.S. Lewis. That was his audience. Uh, he was writing for C.S. Lewis. Well, Okay, fine, but uh, you you do hope that other people would be reading you too. But I think he just accepted that in his lifetime he would struggle to find that audience. But he assumed that they would come because humanity is moving in that direction. It's now easier to understand what he's saying. We, our way of thinking has already changed since the 1950s. We can see so many examples of that. But our whole mindset, our consciousness, has moved on. And when we now confront these ideas, they won't sound so alien or so odd because, you know, we have moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks, uh, Rory, for Susanna Clark. That was the name that I just couldn't Susanna. remember off the top of my head. Um, so another one to look at. Um, who's, who's drawing on Barfield's ideas uh, as well as Lewis's. Um, uh, uh, Sean um, asks uh, whether this video will be posted. Check out the Signum University YouTube channel. So just type in Signum University on YouTube and uh, also asks for a copy of Mr. Barfield's slide. Very illuminating. That's on the website for the literary estate, owenbarfield.org, where you can also find lots of other material, essays, articles, information on other books. Um, so do check out that resource. Um, Douglas A. Anderson. Uh, has a comment on Medea. He says, I noticed it is presented as a later work, but there is a mention of an early manuscript. I recall a letter by J.R.R. Tolkien from 24th November 1944, in which he mentions that Barfield read a short play on Jason 
and Medea at an Inklings meeting. Um, it, it, do, do you know about that, Leslie and, and Jeff? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, we um, have included the footnote and uh, to the letter that actually uh, Tolkien wrote to his son Christopher about um, that Barfield had written. He didn't finish, it doesn't seem like he'd finished the complete reading of it. So we're not sure yet if it is the same drama as in the archive of the Bodleian. In the Bodleian, there is an address on the cover page and the Bodleian, um, they use the address to determine when Barfield uh, wrote the different works. So we are very curious, <laughs> okay is can we like when we return to the Bodleian can we look closer at the paper maybe compare the um the typeface to what he was like the same type right, writer that he was using like earlier to see if this could possibly be the same drama that was read in an inklings meeting in the 1940s you know I, one thing i uh, one of the great things about publishing nowadays is that uh by the time that the Library of Congress material had had returned, uh, um, we we had encountered this and 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 added a footnote, which uh, uh, Dave was um, could easily incorporate in. Which once upon a time publishers wouldn't have been able to easily do such things, but so that um, the the books being printed now are uh, do have a a little expanded footnote on Medea that mentions that and also uh, I think it was uh, Crinitis that talked that talked about um, speaking to Owen about this at one point and reports it in one of his articles so yeah, we have uh, added a little to that. Fantastic well we, we, we've got, just got time for, for, for the last three questions um, but if, if the answers could be short uh, if possible that would be great but um, we'll see how we do. Um, uh, Jake uh, says you write in the introduction in the tower how Lewis re reads uh, the big banister section enthusiastically. I recall Lewis says the silver chair includes a big banister among the book's group of bullies. Does Lewis <laughs> speak directly about the tower's influence on Narnia or is there work to be done in drawing this out? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, it's fascinating. And um, there's also, I don't know if you've noticed in the tower, that the image in the very first section about the children entering the lion. And I've always been fascinating. Is that image, did that inspire um, also Lewis's, you know, the witch lion, the, the wardrobe too. It's just you know, entering the throat of the lion. And so I do see some strong parallels between the two of them, but yes, thank you for uh, that additional reference that I had forgotten about the bullying. Uh, that's that's one change that yes. that he didn't make because uh, Lewis really liked that at first, but then his later reading a few years later, that was one of the sections he said, oh, well, get rid of this or something. Yeah. But I think that shows a shift in Lewis himself during the time, but that's one of the suggestions that was not taken up. Well, there are some that right. we can discern he did take up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many. Uh, we can find a lot of resonance with these authors if we look. <laughs> exactly, and certainly more work to be done as well. So, um, you know, that's one of the things this book gives us is, is material to work with. Um, as Sten says, perhaps not entirely related to the book, but would be interesting to hear something about the how the isolation of the pandemic um, brings could be understood in relation to the consciousness soul, although perhaps particular poems that deal with the subject of isolation. Um, difficult question to answer on the spot perhaps, but um, it is interesting what you were saying about the timing of this volume, um, and I think maybe maybe just further reflection on that question um, is warranted. And, and, and Noen, I know well, you mentioned... I'll just, I'll just jump in there. I, yeah, I please. Did, hint at uh, during this period that we're currently in with Steiner, Rudolf Steiner calls the consciousness soul, our ego, which is what is sort of connected to our soul and our spirit life, feels through the physicality of our body. That's how it most feels. So that's why we are so disconnected. I mean, this is what the virus and the coronavirus is making us feel disconnected. So it's entirely in keeping with this period. Um, 
in two or three thousand years time i mean i know that sounds like <laughs> like a long time three thousand years but you know this is a time scale that bath would like to think about we'd feel differently if this virus was hissing you know we'd have a different reaction to it because humanity would have evolved there would be a different level of consciousness but right now in our time we're feeling it through our body and that's making us feel more aware of our isolation fantastic and there's just time for for the last question that was asked um from danny um uh, Danny says, I've thought the question, how can I finally participate, was what Barfield himself intended his readers to be asking themselves as they finished reading Saving the Appearances. Yet the answer to the question doesn't seem as clear or simply, or a simple maybe. In your presentation, you make clear that writing poetry was essential for Barfield himself. Is that essential for anyone who would experience what he did? What about studying word history, which Barfield promotes in my operation as another technique of achieving the felt change of consciousness, which founds, uh, which finds final participation, and which is also the technique talking practice. I think you have to pursue the inheritance of meaning if you're going to understand yourself and your own consciousness. And I think that's one of the things that Barfield and the other Inklings uh, do well for us. And that was their own path is they, they knew uh, the ancient world, they knew the medieval world, they knew the early modern world, um, they knew this literature and they, and they could draw a certain power from that. But I think you have to have an understanding of what poetry truly is and make it a part of your life, I think is absolutely essential for us to get past this moment of uh, almost microdot empiricism that is seems to empower the world but afflict us at the same time. And I think that's what all the Inklings were uh, working to do is not to just fight the world, but to incorporate it and move past it. And I think that this kind of poetry is absolutely necessary for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would um, echo that as well. I was going to say meaning. It's finding the meaning. Meaning was such an important word for grandfather. One of his book titles is Speaker's Meaning, which is a series of uh, lectures given in North America. But it's about finding the meaning, the meaning of life. You know, it's, it's the question that we're all asking. It's such a human question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, go ahead. Barfield, he talks about the analytic and the poetic impulses and that not, mm. you know, they might oppose, but they need to work together. And he says the poet is someone who they're rapid firing in the poet's brain, the brain, you know, there's the poetic impulse that creates, but then the analytic that is the critic. That polarity. <laughs> yes, the polarity. That, that works polarity too. again. Find, finding the third thing is finding the meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Richard says, thank you all for the inspirational evening. And I'd like to, to reiterate that to all of you. Um, and Richard also says, thank you, David, for your publishing ethos, uh, which is, is also very nice to hear about, um, very yeah. refreshing. Yeah, yeah. So do check out Parlor Press, um, the other books they publish. Um, and if you haven't done so already, this book makes a very good Christmas or Hanukkah gift. Uh, it's beautifully um, laid out. It's got introductions for all these texts. I think um, you've done such an amazing job um, putting this together in a, in a difficult time um, with really kind of accessible introductions. Um, you get all the information there and it looks uh, beautiful as well. And it's an important text that we're very pleased to have access to um, and we wouldn't have had access to it were it not for your work so thank you so much for that it's really really important the work that you've done thank you thank you everyone for uh attending <laughs> brenton says as someone who haunts archives so pleased to see the book <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's it's what we all dream about is finding something like this in the archives. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Danny and Douglas and uh, and Rory. Um, th thank you so much for, for coming out, everyone. And thank you uh, to all our panelists uh, for your time and your um, participation to the very Barfieldian term. Um, and uh, we can continue the conversation on Owen Barfield uh, on the Owen Barfield Facebook uh, page on the Owen Barfield Twitter um, and uh, at future events at Signum University as well. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a, a wonderful rest of your day or evening, depending on where Thanks, you are. Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>
Thanks, man. Bye-bye.